Sophie May is designed with the idea of, yes, we want to give you a cute outfit and we want you to feel good about yourself, but it's so much more than that. We want women to feel good when they come in and we also want them to feel like they have a safe place to go. Having a dream of owning a boutique for 10 years, I wanted to create that kind of a space where we have women that come in and they are really focused not only on finding an outfit, but they just want to create connection. I always felt like when I was at the local shopping boutiques and the small businesses, they really paid attention to me and what I needed. And it was more than just shopping, but it was also a way for me to build my confidence. Even if I had a bad day, I could go in and talk about more than just clothing. When you say you went to Sophie May Boutique, you're like, I went to the cutest boutique. All the girls are so sweet. They have the best clothes. They're not pushy. I don't want you to buy anything from Sophie May if you don't absolutely love it. And I want you to love that experience that you had too. And so I hope people feel that when they come in. And I think that they do. I handpick every single piece that we have in our store. I feel it. I touch it. I make sure that it's made with good products, that it's going to last. The overall idea of shopping locally, shopping small, there's such a bigger meaning behind it. The biggest thing for, for me that I would tell people is to keep going. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. So there's always things you can do to keep growing. And I think just in entrepreneurship, I think anybody who is an entrepreneur knows that it is one of the hardest things you will ever do. Before we jump into our next conversation on the Wolf and Bull podcast, I want to take a quick moment to thank each and every one of you for tuning into this episode. All of the team here at Daremore Media prides themselves in the work that they put into each and every one of our episodes. And the best way to possibly help us is to leave a like, a comment, and a subscription. Our main priority is to facilitate honest conversation with captivating individuals that brings each and every one of our listeners and viewers a nugget of advice wisdom or insight that they can take away from every one of our episodes. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you enjoy this episode of The Wolf and Ball. My name is Erica Hilligus and I'm the owner of Sophie May Boutique. Our boutique is a women's clothing store located in Gilbert, Arizona, and we focus on bringing a very unique shopping experience to women in the area. And we try to create a welcoming, safe environment. Why does your work at Sophie May Boutique matter? My background is actually in mental health. So my degree is in social work. I was a mental health counselor for eight years back in Iowa. Um, and I also had, during that time, been really interested and in, into shopping boutiques. So one of my favorite hobbies every Friday when I got paid was to go shopping at local boutiques. And I think that for me, it was such a way to decompress from the hard job that I had. Um, and I always felt like when I was in there at the local shopping boutiques and the small businesses, they really paid attention to me and what I needed. And it was more than just shopping, but it was also a way for me to build my confidence and I felt like even if I had a bad day, I could go in and talk about more than just clothing. I could talk about my job, what I was going through, my personal experiences. And so having a dream of owning a boutique for 10 years, I wanted to create that kind of a space in Gilbert as well, where we have women that come in and they are really focused not only on finding an outfit, but they just want to create connection. And we have always wanted Sophie May to be a safe space. So Sophie May is designed with the idea of, yes, we want to give you a cute outfit and we want you to feel good about yourself, but it's so much more than that. So we want to build confidence. We want women to feel good when they come in. And we also want them to feel like they have a safe place to go. So for instance, we had a girl that came in, her boyfriend had just broken up with her. And she said the first place that she wanted to go was Sophie May because she knew that the employees would make her feel better. She could buy a cute outfit. Um, so we're really we're really trying to create that environment to build confidence, a safe space, and just have connection with women in the area. I before we talk about some of the other things we're going to talk about, I did want to bring up to you that you probably don't remember this, but <laughs> years ago, so 2021, I think is when it was. At the time, you were you didn't have your actual physical like um, shop yet. You you did have the small shop, the um. The one that you'd bring to yeah, like the mobile boutique. The mobile boutique. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. And I actually didn't live here yet. 
I was still living in San Diego at the time and my parents lived here and my sister did too. My sister was still in high school at the time. And, uh, we came out here for, I don't even remember what we came out here for or something for fun. <laughs> for fun. No, we came out here and I remember it was like a really hard time in my life and I was really struggling. I had some friendship issues going on back home. So went, went out of town to go see my family and we were in downtown Gilbert mm -hmm. and your shop was there. Your mobile boutique was there. Yeah. And I remember like having such a pleasant experience. That was the first time I ever met you. Now, I don't expect you to remember me because that was a long time ago. Yeah. But um, I do remember how wonderful it was. I had this really beautiful dress that I bought that was a burnt orange and I loved it. And I do remember... Was it like satin? Um, Like a burnt satin. orange satin? I, it Ish. wasn't satin. It was like a pet, like I want to say it's like a peasant dress. It had like yes. a tie right here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I loved it. And I remember I wore it to the Renaissance fair that same weekend. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I, uh, um, I do remember like you, you were so complimentary when I tried it on you took a little picture of me and everything. Oh. Yeah. I know. So you're like, when did this happen? I have no <laughs> idea. But just to piggyback off yeah. what you were saying, it was such a pleasant experience. Yeah. And I feel like that's missing a lot. Um, especially in the world of just online shopping, you know, right. which is yes. the majority. And I know, obviously, yeah. it's good to have a space there because online shopping is yeah. lucrative and necessary these days. Yeah. But at the same time, having an environment where young women can go and actually feel welcome and have someone who's talking to them and they just don't want to be like, leave me alone. I'm just, mm -hmm. I know you don't really care, you yeah. know, when you go into some other stores that will rename or remain nameless. Sometimes it's like, just, I just want to browse. Yeah, totally. No. And we even I'm, get customers like that. I think we uh, do a pretty good job of reading the room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. But you know, your space is so, uh, I've, I found it just very welcoming and all of the girls who work there are so yeah. kind Thank and you. you have like a very, um, universal shared mission there that really reflects what you just said. So I just wanted to throw my two cents in. That means a lot to me. Of course. That's pretty much like our entire, your story is why I opened Sophie May. Love that. Yeah. Well, you basically covered the second question, so we'll yeah. skip right over that. Um, so on the Sophie May site, it says that you attended Iowa State University and pursued a career in mental health counseling for seven years. You also mentioned that briefly a second ago. Yeah. What got you interested in pursuing a career working with those struggling with their mental health? I would say the biggest reason that I wanted to go into mental health is that my mom suffers from bipolar disorder, um, and she was a single parent for most of my life, um, and I was an only child. So for a lot of my life, it was me and my mom against the world. But with her struggling with her mental health and having bipolar, um, she manages it really well. She has always been someone who advocates for um, going to therapy and doing all the things that make her healthier. I think growing up around that and then also myself, I grew up with anxiety, but I didn't realize that I had anxiety. Mm. So I definitely had episodes of anxiety throughout my childhood and into high school. I struggled with ADHD. Um, test taking was really hard for me. Sitting still was really hard for me. Yeah, it's just pretty um, quiet right now. Yeah. And I think like growing up to being a child in the nineties, cause I was born in 1989. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was as much of a mental health push. And so I think it was really hard to diagnose it. And I think it was looked at more as a behavioral concern instead of potentially this child needs therapy or they need to see a doctor or um, they need interventions. And so growing up and not understanding why I was feeling the way I was feeling, but then also growing up with a parent that had mental health struggles. When I went into college, I knew that I wanted to help people, whatever that looked like. Um, and then as I started to take classes, I realized I was really interested in social work itself and just bringing like awareness and really working towards mental health awareness, like I said, and then um, just trying to make a difference in that in that field. Yeah, my mom's in the, the medical field. And when I was really young, I was, uh, I wouldn't say diagnosed, but I was determined by a doctor to be hyperactive. So instead yeah. of, you know, giving me medication. My mom was like, oh, we'll just throw them into something called early fives between kindergarten yeah. <laughs> or preschool and kindergarten. And then we'll throw them into sports. 
And so, yeah, yeah that's Let basically. Let them work yeah. that energy out. Yeah. Well. I mean, same thing. I did like, they, I went to like pre-K mm-hmm. and they were like, nope, she needs another year. Yeah. And so then I, yeah. I mean, I technically like was in the right grade, mm-hmm. but I could have been really like young for my age because I was a September baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they also, my mom had me in every sport imaginable. So I played year round soccer, year round volleyball. I did basketball. Mm-hmm. I did track, um, which I think was super helpful. But I also think like now there's probably more, more help for kids, more support yeah. for kids mm-hmm. beyond just like, let's get them as busy as possible, which yeah. I think is great. But sometimes you need finding a balance. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. it, well, now being in my, my 30s, I can't do sports year round. So, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You gotta, gotta find, find that balance. Yeah, gotta find another way to channel that uh, that excessive energy. Yeah, right, right. So e- energy too. drinks yeah. help. <laughs> and then, you know, working constantly. Yeah, that's true. What I do. Yeah. 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 It's transitioning from the healthcare industry to the clothing small boutique industry is quite a jump that yeah. I can guess uh, not many people make. Yeah. What drove your desire to start your own business and how did you navigate the early stages? A big driving factor for me was uh, COVID. So I was, so I moved from Iowa and then I worked at ASU. So I worked as an academic advisor for pre-med, so School of Life Sciences, uh, for about two years. And even though I was an academic advisor, I could tell that I was hired because I had a mental health background. So working with students with that are in pre-med, <laughs> you're basically doing mental health counseling. Um, <laughs> Good point. Yeah. And then, yeah. So, I mean, those students, I'm they're, I mean, they're the, the future of our <laughs> medical system. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. And so when you mix pre-med students with COVID, it was mm. one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. Mm. Um you're dealing with students that are feeling really isolated, but you're also dealing with students who are not getting into their shadowing because of the COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. And so they're just feeling really isolated. They feel like they're behind in their medical, I guess, like journey. So that was really interesting. And when COVID happened, I just realized that even though I love the mental health field, I didn't feel like I was reaching my full potential And then when ASU decided to bring all the employees back to campus, I just was like, there's just no way I'm doing this. I'm not going back. And so I had had a conversation. (laughs) I had a conversation with my husband of like, I want to be my own boss. I've always wanted to own my own business. I've always wanted to own a clothing store. And my husband is the best human being alive. He was like, all right, quit your job. And I was like, what do you mean quit my job? (laughs) So he's like, quit it. He's like, what do you have to lose? So I uh, started, I bought this, um, like, how to open a boutique guide for, like, $30. <laughs> and I had been, like, on Pinterest every day. I had been, like, Googling all those boutiques and following what they do. And then I bought this, like, $30 how-to guide, started looking at it. Um, while I was working, I was, like, on this, like, how-to guide trying to, like, create my own LLC and just, like had no idea what I was doing. I'd never opened a business before. I'm following this how-to guide that has like grammatical errors all throughout it. And I created the LLC under Sophie May. And I talked to my boss at the time, who is still one of my friends. She's also from Iowa. So it was random that, you know, my boss was from the same same state. And I told her, I think I'm going to quit. I'm going to open my own business. And she was like, (laughs) you're going to open a clothing store? And I was like, yeah, so so a lot of my friends and even family have said, I feel like you were like Elle Woods. And you were like, well, how she said like one day, like, Love I think it. I'm going to go to law school today. And they were like, I feel like you were just kind of like, I'm going to open a boutique today. I'm going to quit my job. I think a lot of people forget that we have free choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Stop doing what we're Elle doing Woods if we right. don't yeah. like it. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, but you're that's right. Great. It was such a big jump. Um, but I think just like honestly, COVID and just kind of wanting to open my own business and really go for it was like the driving factor. Hmm. And it was the best decision I ever made. I think that's a really interesting thing on a side note with COVID, because in our experience of talk, because we've done maybe a handful of these videos so far. But in our experience of like talking with um various business owners, it always seems to be one or two things. It, it seems to be COVID started this for me. Yeah. Or, Oh my God, I made it through COVID. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's very it's a very interesting like facet of uh of the last four years that it's just such a pivotal point in people's lives. But you know, 
pandemic, of course, it would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone that's... had their own story through the past four years. <laughs> exactly, yep. like hell and high water. Oh, right? Yeah. Did you have any family or mentors that inspired you to become an entrepreneur? It's okay if not. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, not really. Mm. I would say I. I would say when I moved to Arizona, I would say in Iowa, small business is not a huge deal there, I guess. It didn't feel like there was a big push to shop small in Iowa. Um, I'm not sure why, but moving to Arizona, I found that it w- it's like small business world out here mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's amazing. And so I started to connect with people in my neighborhood and a ton of people own their own small businesses and were entrepreneurs. And um, I started shopping smaller and realizing like the importance of shopping small and supporting small businesses throughout the community. And so I think I really got the push from a few people that I was connecting with in my community in Arizona. Um, But yeah, I just, yeah, I don't think it was as, as big of a deal back home in Iowa. Yeah. That is interesting. Cause I would, I would think that, cause I, I lived in Minnesota for 10 years. Yeah. I was in uh, Duluth, Minnesota and then from Duluth, we went to California and then California went to Las Vegas and yeah. then back to California and then here. So I've lived in like the coldest place in the country and the hottest place in the country um, <laughs> in my life, which is great. Uh, I like to find a medium, but unfortunately mm-hmm. I can't seem to find that. Uh, but yeah, that seemed to be the case. Um, maybe not so much in uh, Minnesota. Cause I feel like Minnesota is probably close related to Iowa. Um, but like Midwest. some, yeah, Midwest kind of a diff- <laughs> same flavor, uh, just different temperature maybe. Um, but, uh, California was very much like small business as well. And yeah. I think a lot of people from California because of COVID came out here yeah. and we're like, I'm going to bring my business cause the taxes and the rules out there are crazy. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, yeah. uh, that's interesting. i never would have considered that. Yeah. yeah. It's also cool to hear that, uh, you know, like my, my dad is entrepreneurial at heart and he's probably the only one in my family like that. Most of my family is very academic, like academically driven in the sense of lots of professors, lots of PhDs and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, my dad, you know, he's a successful business owner, but I sort of went after him when I was growing up because he was like my direct influence throughout my life. So I became a bit entrepreneurial as well. But it's really cool to hear that you didn't have like someone, not to say my dad was breathing down my neck, but you didn't have someone who was looking at you from day one saying, uh, you know, you need to start a business because I said so or because I did it and you're just watching me. You sort of that was organically something that you fell into. Yeah, I actually feel the opposite. I felt like growing up, even though I didn't grow up with my dad. Um, I thought I felt like there was always a big push from society, at least in the Midwest and from the family that I did have to you graduate high school, you go to college, you get your four year degree, you get your job Um, a little bit status quo ish in Iowa. Like you go to college, you get married, you have two kids, a doodle, a white picket fence, (laughs) you know, as we all have doodles. And I I have a doodle, too, (laughs) for sure. Only thing we're missing is a white picket fence. (laughs) But just kind of like you follow this exact path, Mm -hmm. which is great for some people. Um, But I think that, you know, my husband and I don't have children. We have five dogs Um, and it's kind of like children. (laughs) Yeah, no, it it is. Yeah. Um, But I think I always knew that I was meant to do something a little different. Clothing, fashion, Mm -hmm. online boutique industry is incredibly competitive. Where there's opportunity, there's obviously a high level of competition. Yeah. How do you approach networking and building professional relationships? So I actually got a big start through a networking group, a women's boss babes group over in my neighborhood. Um, And it's expanded quite a bit um, into the Mesa, Gilbert, Queen Creek area. So they were really the driving factor into me starting my boutique. So before I quit my job, I went to this meeting, told them the dreams I had, had a long conversation, ended up staying for three hours. Um, I started attending those meetings every month, um, and they were a big driving factor in that. And I think making those connections has been the driving force as to why Sophie May has grown so much um, between having being close with a photographer, being close with real estate people, and then just building connections with other people that own businesses. Like I'm friends with someone who owns a wine bar and we do pop ups at her shop. And then I think also I'm really active in the market community. So there's a ton of markets here. Uh, There's one called Made with Love Mm -hmm. and they do markets all over the valley. Yeah, There's a lot of farmers markets. And so I think participating in those too, you meet tons of other small business owners and you build connections, you build 
we do tons of collabing. So we do um, lots of different events. We've done tons of events at our store even where I bring those small businesses into my store as well. And so I think just building those connections has been key for me, especially other women-owned businesses. That has been huge. Mm. Just absolutely amazing. Yeah, It's interesting that you say that, you know, a lot of the growth that you've experienced comes from face-to-face meeting when you expect it to be the opposite. And I think a lot of business owners do expect that. They throw their website up online and they throw their product up online. They say, this is a great product. This is a great website. This is a great service. And then crickets. And I think it's interesting, her point that she just made about that, because it's kind of, you know, harkens back to the days before the internet. Yeah. And it's so important to, especially as a woman owned business, especially because I mean, I come from the supply chain industry and I know you alluded to tech being a boys club. Let me tell you what, supply chain industry is definitely a boys club. And uh, while I love (laughs) most of the men that I deal with on a daily basis, they're all lovely, very, very intelligent, capable people. Um, There's something to be said about connecting with women in whatever industry, but even bigger than that, entrepreneurial wise, that's a huge asset, I'm sure, for growth Uh, marketing, but also because you're willing to help each other. You said you had a friend who owned a wine bar. That's fantastic. What a great opportunity for you guys both to help each other. And I I think focusing on not only what can people do for you, but what can you do for them, especially in that small business realm, it's like being able to also help other small businesses is a huge goal of Sophie Mm May. So carrying small businesses within our shop has been wonderful. But then I think I've also created some of the best friendships I've ever had by meeting those people too. Especially, so um, we're about the same age and it's so difficult when, especially if you don't have kids. So we, I'm I'm currently pregnant, but we didn't have kids. We've been married for a while and we didn't have kids. And it's always been like, it's difficult when you're not in high school or college anymore and you don't have like a regular yeah. group of people you're seeing every day. It's so difficult. Well, it's, it's either people are talking about their kids or they're parting it up. And, you know, I'm 32, basically. And going out with my single guy friends is not an option I have anymore. Um, if I unless I want to develop a, a drinking habit, <laughs> which I don't. So uh, I think it, the interesting thing about all that is that transition, as I mentioned a second ago, Internet wise, that transition from Everyone's saying, oh, you'll find all the friends and all the support groups and everything online, I think is total rubbish. Well, it's a good start. I mean, you said that yeah. you did have a with the Boss Babes group in, in the, the yeah. Well, East. Yeah, East if Valley. you use it as a tool. Well, yeah. right, right. And that's it's a great start because, I mean, but people don't usually take that next step. No. Right. And yeah. I think that's amazing that you've been able yeah. to not just network for your business, but also for your personal, you know, right. everyone friends are needed in life, right? You need to have relationships with people, I think. So that's fantastic. You mentioned the uniqueness of being a female entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest challenges you've faced and how have you overcome them? I think being a woman owned business, especially when you say you own a clothing store comes with its own set of stereotypes. Um, I get a lot of, that's so cute Mm -hmm. that you own a clothing boutique or, oh, that must be like a fun hobby. And so just like little comments like that. And I mostly get them from women. Um, Yeah. So I'll meet new women. And one of my friends might say, oh, my gosh, this is Erica. She owns a clothing boutique. And they're like, oh, how fun. How cute. Like, that's adorable. Um, And I know that a lot of times people probably don't mean that negatively. Or maybe I'm just thinking they don't mean that negatively. Um, But I think that that is such a. I don't even know how to say it. Like it's a little patronizing. Yeah. Just a little bit. Right. Because people don't truly understand. I think a lot of people think that when you own a clothing boutique, you're just playing dress up every day Mm -hmm. and you're just like wearing pretty things and you just are wearing the cutest outfits and you're just having so much fun. In reality, my hair is usually in a nasty bun. I don't have any makeup on. I'm wearing like clothes from high school and I'm up until four o'clock in the morning, unboxing, tagging, ordering the amount of work that goes into the behind the scenes of owning a business, unless you own a business, you don't really understand. Um, But I think there's an overall idea that owning a clothing store is really glamorous. Um, And truly it's not, (laughs) you have to be really passionate about what you're doing there are times when I've wanted to give up, right? Like I, uh, I work nonstop. I'm constantly doing events. I'm managing staff. I'm managing payroll. 
I'm doing all of the things behind the scenes. So I think that has been a big challenge. I also think there is, there are conversations that I've had with men specifically that do feel really patronizing. So for instance, I I had a conversation with a man at a party that we went to like a barbecue thing. And he, we told him we are opening up a brick and mortar. And his first response, he looked at me and he's like, aren't brick and mortars dead? (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) no, okay. (laughs) Let's hope not. (laughs) Well, yeah. And so that's exactly what I said. I'm like, well, I hope not because I just threw all my life savings into it. Like I'm bringing it back to life then. (laughs) Right. But like, I think just like the overall, I think the biggest challenge is just those kind of comments. So super patronizing comments, whether that's, oh, that's so cute. That's adorable. Or aren't brick and mortars dead? Or wow, that must be a really competitive market. Like, how's that going for you? Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think, I have run into conversations too about where you just don't feel like people take you very seriously or that you're smart enough to run a business Mm -hmm. or that there's no way you're doing it all on your own or that there's no way you're successful as you claim to be. So I think just kind of dealing with, I guess, those stereotypes, but honestly, I've, I've, it doesn't bother me that much. Yeah. As it shouldn't. No, but no. but but at the same time, I do I agree with you that I would err on the side of I think most people when they say comments like that aren't really thinking through what they're saying yeah, or intentionally exactly. trying to be hurtful or anything like that. Right. But it truly comes from a place where unless you're an entrepreneur or yeah. business owner, you truly have no idea exactly yeah. how much time, effort, blood, sweat, tears, time, everything right. goes into I yeah. mean, just like the stuff people don't think about, like the payroll or the taxes or the yeah. or the taxes. just the the leadership and the, the, the yeah, taxes, taxes. <laughs> like the managing of personalities you have to do, especially when you have a team. Like I yeah. know you have a team of people, and you know, in a perfect world, everyone mm-hmm. gets along perfectly all the time, and I'm yeah. sure they're all lovely people. So I'm not, yeah. impl- I'm not trying to <laughs> implicate anything, <Yeah. laughs> but I'm just saying, like, there's always effort yeah. that gets put into that. So, and the more you grow. The more learning learning curves you have, mm-hmm. more stuff comes up. Um, growth doesn't always mean more money either. No. I've learned. Um, yeah, there we. I've definitely in the last six months been going through some growing pains. Um, sometimes you can grow too fast, and just learning how to manage that has been. Yeah. Also, you know, it's also hard. Also, being a first time entrepreneur too, not even just being a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned so much and taught myself so much. I've made mistakes along the way. Um, so that's a, that can be challenging as well, too. The, the patronizing comments uh, from men and women uh, are equally felt. Yeah. On the male <laughs> yeah. side. They don't. Yeah. I think the, the thing that uh, people don't really talk about is like, believe me, I get those comments, too. Oh, you you film with a camera. Wow. That's a little cool little hobby mm-hmm. you got there. Yeah, well, it's an expensive camera. <laughs> it can't be a hobby. Oh, you have a podcast. Yeah, well, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it. <laughs> yeah. um, now, so you mentioned passion. How do you maintain your passion while handling handling day to day operations? The first thing is is that I'm just a very passionate person. Um, I put like 150 percent into everything I do, whether it's good or bad. So I think that there's a little bit of that that's just like instilled in me. I'm just a very passionate human being, and you could ask any of my family and friends, and they would say that about me. I would also say I really, if I'm struggling or I'm feeling burnout or I'm struggling with my anxiety. I just continue to think about my why. And so my why really is my family and um, in particular, my husband and just what kind of future I want for us. And also, I just want to be happy. And so what does that look like? And if I ever get to the point where owning my business doesn't make me happy, what do I need to do to create that inner happiness? Right. But truly, Sophie May makes me the happiest I've ever been. It's the best decision I've ever made. So I also think about that if I'm ever kind of feeling like I need to find that passion. Um, I also do things like go to a new trade show. So trade shows give me so much passion. So you go to these big events where you buy all your clothes and you meet new companies, new businesses. And honestly, when I go and I feel clothing and I see the colors and the new trends, there is nothing that makes me more excited and just so passionate about what I'm doing. I also will pull a shift. So if I really need to feel that passion again, I will pick up a shift and I'll go work at Sophie May. And I always have a customer that just makes me feel amazing. And they come in and they're so excited about their purchases. And then, or I get like a message on Instagram and they say, Hey, 
I was feeling really insecure about myself and I feel so much better. Thank you for helping me find these jeans. I never thought I'd find a pair of jeans that fit me correctly. So I think just knowing what events, what shifts I can pick up will also kind of give me that passion back. It's a huge testament too to just how um, passionate you are because like you mentioned some some Yahoo saying something about brick and mortar. Yeah. I remember <laughs> yeah. when um I remember when you opened and I remember that line was like around yeah. the whole building like twice. Yes. Yeah. And it was a hot day oh, we too. Watched those videos too. It was yeah, and it was like wasn't it middle of summer or something? Or it like, was 118 that yeah, day. I was gonna say it was like a hot day. <laughs> yeah. God say that seriously. That takes yeah. a lot of there so, are a lot all of, of our people. balloons were popping outside and I was yeah. terrified. I was sweating. I'm like, no one's gonna show up. And you know what? <laughs> and it was amazing. And yeah. and I, I know you had mentioned too as well, like this is definitely like small business central and there's a lot of people who have a lot of, you know, drive and that's amazing. And obviously that's something we're passionate about too. Yeah. But um, I've seen lots of brick and mortar businesses open in just the past year and I have not seen a line that long at any of them. Yeah, so it's a huge, you. it's a huge testament to just how many people can really feel that passion coming yeah. from you. And uh, I mean, congratulations, Thank you. but you can tell yeah. now too, you, your eyes light up when you talk about it. But I think that's also a huge thing in the success Thank of you. a business. Obviously there's all sorts of factors. Like yeah. sometimes you, there's even like things you can't control, right. but that is, I mean, I'm a believer that <laughs> the more passionate or the more you care about something, yeah. the more likely you are to actually succeed and find right. the luck that you're looking for. Yeah. So um, yeah, love, love that you, you, you. feel so strongly about that it makes me want to cry <laughs> oh <laughs> I tend to, thank I tend god to we've got people. cameras here to capture it <laughs> no and i'm not a cute crier either it's zoom not in zoom in <laughs> no but yeah amazing yeah. amazing thank you i appreciate that the fashion online clothing industry is a rapidly changing la- landscape yeah. per your website sophie may boutique is a hand-picked collection of women's and young contemporary apparel accessories and shoes we refresh the site often and i'm paraphrasing and we offer the season's best trends along with classic staples that won't break the bank. How do you anticipate and adapt to emerging trends while staying true to your Sophie Mays aesthetic? So I think that we really focus on, we're trying to serve your everyday girl. So what I mean by that is we're, we like to follow the fashion trends, but we're not crazy fashion forward. So what I mean by that is your everyday girl might be, I don't know, a 32 year old that comes in, they want something that's for loungewear, or maybe they need to wear a dress to a wedding. They're looking for that. Maybe they're going on a date. So what is something that your everyday girl would need for just their life, their lifestyle? So, but it's, it's still trendy. Um, so by contemporary, I follow contemporary trend trends as far as I will, I'm on a weekly trend call. So through the trade shows that I go to, and then there's this place called Boutique Hub. We do a weekly phone call and they go over what the trends are. They also go over what are like super trendy trends. So maybe, gosh, what are some of the new trends? I'm like, there's what no are those way. big red, like fluffy boots that people wear that look like they're yeah. like, like those crazy, like $400 yeah. high, but you know what I'm talking about, the rubber boots. Oh, like, yeah, like, like Balenciaga. I was, I was going to say something like the, the bow in the hair. Like, like, I don't know. That, no, so that's a trend we're, we're grabbing. Okay. Yeah. So the co- bow in the so hair. So coquette right now is really in. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, so, so the new thing yeah. is coquette, coquette, everything at first. And sometimes when these come in, I'm like, what? But then we, um, I have a local business. She's a small business as well. She does all of our graphic tees. She creates everything for us. Mm. Um, and so her business is called desert Ave amazing business. So she goes, Hey, coquette's really in. I'm like, what's coquette. She's like, Oh, you know, all the bows. I'm like, why? Well, what do you mean? And she's like, bows are in. And I'm like, okay. So then I go on this trend call and they're like, coquette, bows are in. You bow everything. So she's like, I'm going to make you all these bow shirts. So right now at the store, we have the cutest. Oh, they're so cute. I'm all into it now. They have like, um, I'll be there later yeah. today. I'm, I have a <laughs> yeah. infinity appointment. So yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I'll be in later. <laughs> so basically, um, like my favorite t-shirt right now is um, these little iced coffees all over the shirt. And then has a bow on them. No. Oh. Like a bow on the coffee. Cute. And then we have one that has a giant iced coffee with a bow on it. And it says like iced coffee social club. So anything like social club, hampton coquette, bows, they're all in. We ordered hair bows, the whole nine yards. 
I feel like you're going to say something. I, look, I'm look, I am merely <laughs> a, I'm a simple creature. OK, got yeah, everyone knows like guys. He's got his girl dad sweater on and that's about it's as like, extensive as you should see my husband. He He's worn Under Armour since 2000. Yeah, we, we pick wears. a brand and it's either the same color or it's the same yeah. brand into infinity. Right? I'm actually impressed you're wearing blue today, not black. I always wear black. I'm so always, yeah. all of my friends joke that my husband has a uniform. It's a black Under Armour shirt and red Nike shorts. He wears it everywhere. That's hilarious. Well, smart. It, it makes it crazy. Easy. It drives me absolutely bananas. We had a conversation the other day about him kind of upping his style and he's so defensive. It's like, well, here's the here's the problem. Like, well, he, well here's the problem that I've seen is like because I think the only place that I can now legally shop at is Banana Republic. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I don't yeah, mean like I'm fancy. not barred from any other like store. I don't mean I just mean in the sense that it's a crime. Say, like it's Costco. a fashion crime crime if i shop anywhere else right mm-hmm. so like I, i've I, like i've tried like all saints which i like the brand but it just it talk about breaking fit. the bank it doesn't fit that one my, breaks the bank it doesn't fit me I, like yeah. it's meant for like skinny dudes and i'm not really skinny <laughs> Yeah, um, it's, it's meant so, when you were like 22. Yeah, and then some my husband can relate. Yeah, I'm getting old now, and then like I don't want to dress like men's warehouse all the time. I did that for a period of time. That was terrible. Um, so I mean, <laughs> I, I was gonna ask the question yeah. I was gonna ask is who, and this is not serious. Who makes these trend decisions? Is this just is this, it's just a indicator from well, the economy? Like the new like so set like sad beige mom yeah. is out yes and mob yes. wife is in yes oh yeah. he is the, you know. I know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> so don't worry yeah yes so I do. basically like they're saying that like beige and the, like all the neutral colors of just like wearing the full beige outfit is gone and now you should be wearing like cheetah print and leopard and big hair. big old coat yeah. big Who's hair they? so I don't know <laughs> who is they <laughs> I think well. I'm I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. You're more of an expert at this than I am. But I think that people like monitor the TikTok and Instagram yeah. and okay. Pinterest. Okay. And well, I think like the big influencers, too. Okay. Yeah. Are like, I'm going to do this. And then I'll, it's kind of like like, you know, I saw Regina George wearing army pants and flip flops. So <laughs> I did. So I think like if you <laughs> yes. see like a Kendall Jenner or like an Alex Earl or whatever. Well, yeah, I'm just yeah. thinking of like like think of who some Taylor Swift, for example. Yeah, exactly. Anything she wears. Yeah, is like the jeans that she wore to the Super Bowl with a cutout. We already have them on the way. Wow, I love those jeans. (laughs) Like, wait, (laughs) really? Yeah, I think you love those jeans. They're super on back order, but we will have them. I bet. Well, but but that 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 goes to show you exactly. Yeah. So what I'm saying though is like, we will follow trends like that. Um, but we're not going to follow like runway trends. Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, yeah. who like who <laughs> yeah. does, wears those? Things? I know, but people buy it. I don't know. I mean, I don't know who, but <laughs> yeah, like your every like your everyday girl. But yes, yeah, so we I do a lot. The way that I find out about the trends, obviously, I'm always on social media, Instagram, mm-hmm. TikTok, but also I do actual trend calls every single week. Um, I'm talking with other small businesses, like I said, with Brie with Desert Ave. We're talking about that coquette trend, um, and people come in specifically looking for it. They already have. I I put out on Sunday, I put out like, I think 80 bows and we sold 42 just on Sunday. Mm. Like, wow. That's wild. Yeah. Mm. I, it's blowing my mind. I like, know. I'm like looking at you. Is this going? Well, yeah. here's the thing. It's I like <laughs> the ice coffee social club today. I shut <laughs> up. That's so funny. <laughs> well, well, the interesting thing is like you, you talk to like business owners in different industries and yeah. they, they share so many unique insights that you wouldn't consider as a consumer. Yeah. Right. So like we just had a, a company on that's like specifically logistics tech industry. And it's like, oh, I don't really think about how my product gets from point A to point B because yeah. most people don't because uh, we only have so much space up here. But uh, that's that's just it blows my mind. I learn <laughs> something new every day. Um, so obviously we've talked about online. We've talked a little bit about some of the struggles as a, a small business owner. And I think one of them, specifically, in my opinion, is establishing brand presence, a mission and a reasonable strategy for reaching their goals. Right. What strategies do you employ to effectively market Sophie May in an increasingly competitive market? I would say in person, I am everywhere I can possibly be. So uh, we have a mobile boutique that we still have, we, still around. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it's my husband and I built and created a tiny house on wheels. Mm-hmm. So um, we go to markets almost every single weekend all around the valley. So we're hitting up every city we possibly can to make sure that people know we exist. And we are going to these markets, selling clothes. We have the fitting rooms. We pass out our cards. We say, hey, if you need to return or need an exchange, you can come to our store every day. And, you know, we have more at our storefront. 
So I'm constantly trying to get my name out there that way. I would say also, I have no problem going door to door. So when we opened our brick and mortar, I was passing out flyers to every single neighborhood in the Cooley Station Gilbert area, Mm -hmm. every apartment complex, sending out emails, doing pop-ups. Um, pop-ups have been huge as far as in person. So those markets and then just doing little pop-ups with a rack of clothes saying, Hey, we exist. I also think, um, our social media has really taken off. So our Instagram page, we have a lot of followers on there. So I'm making sure I'm posting almost every single day, constantly doing reels. I think for us, most of our online sales have come from Instagram, um, Mm -hmm. and just that constant presence. And then, One thing that I'm really focused on and just hired was um, we had a whole website redesign because I made it from scratch off Shopify and it was the most horrible website ever. I'm not a web designer, Um, but I did the best that I could for the first two years. So we had it completely reconstructed in December and we now have a team that we have hired out that is constantly working on our SEO, Google searches. Um, They're trying to optimize all of our keywords So when somebody types in like little black dress or black dress or wedding guest dress, for for an example, Sophie May will pop up in there. Um, If you type in local boutiques or boutique Gilbert, Sophie May is one of the top five that pops up in that search. Um, I'm also constantly working on updating our Google, having people leave reviews for us. I'm sending out emails constantly. And so I think that's something that I'm really trying to grow in, especially in our third year is we're really trying to focus on that web design and then that online side of things, because that's maybe where I struggle more. I'm really, I feel like I'm pretty good at the in-person, um, but online is a whole new ball game and it's really competitive, like you said, and it's also intimidating at times. And so yeah, that's been a, it's, that's been, that's probably the biggest barrier that I have. Well, I think the, because speaking from experience, it's the industry that I was in. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> the problem is it's a pay to play industry now. It used to be. Yeah. And I know there's a ton of people that will probably disagree with me. They'll probably be like, oh, organic still exists. It does. I'm not saying mm-hmm. it doesn't. But Google is slowly closing those doors to where they're saying, OK, yeah. well, we just want you to pay us money. Yeah. So uh, that's yeah, it's yeah. it's online is difficult. And it kind of segues into our, our next question. How do you differentiate your store's in-person shopping experience to keep customers coming back instead of just going online? Truly the experience. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, I want Sophie May to feel like the most unique experience that you've had in a good way. Not, not a weird way, um, but like, I don't know. <laughs> You'll remember it <laughs> or yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so like my whole goal is like when you say you went to Sophie May Boutique, you're like I went to the cutest boutique. All the girls are so sweet. They have the best clothes. They're not pushy. When you I, I shopped at so many boutiques where I'm like, yeah. Like, I like what I got, kind of. I don't know if I really wear it. I don't want you to buy anything from Sophie May if you don't absolutely love it. Mm. So every piece you have from Sophie May, I want you to be obsessed with it. And I want you to love it. And I want you to love that experience that you had, too. And so I hope people feel that when they come in. And I think that they do. Um, So I think the unique shopping experience is we created the store. It's only 800 square feet, not even. It's supposed to be an extension of the tiny boutique. So our slogan, instead of shop small, is shop tiny. And so when people come in, you really feel that personalized experience when you're in there and you, you feel like, you know, we want to make sure, you know, you matter. And so I think when you come in, you just feel really good. Mm. You feel good about yourself and you feel like you just, you, you walk, you walk in happy and you walk out even happier. Mm -hmm. So we have some, like, we have some diehard Sophie May girls. They come in couple times a week. Yeah. <laughs> so in comparison, would you say they're incomparable to the Taylor Swifties out there? Or We have some. <laughs> yeah. We have one girl. She's like there every single Thursday when we have new arrivals. Oh, that's she awesome. Is, she is there. Kudos wow. to that one girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A so, Tati. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously, you know, the industry yeah. and generally across the board, specifically with online, is just, just changing so much. Yeah. Um, a lot of companies are probably feeling that, especially when it comes to their brick and mortar locations. And you look at massive corporations like Timu, Sheen, Amazon, they're churning out styles and a bunch of different brands, like uh, almost in an apocalyptic way. Um, What do you say to potential customers or critics who claim that the future of fashion, um, that that's the future of fashion or ask why they should go to you instead? Oh man, there's nothing I despise more than Timu and Sheen. Same. (laughs) I mean, that's a, that, there's a lot of stuff that I feel about, like, Timu Sheen situation. 
um, just like ethically, Mm -hmm. morally. Um, So that's a huge one right there. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as Sophie May goes, you're going to like your we carry a pack of six. So there are six of that dress. Mm -hmm. And that's all you're going to get. So nobody Mm -hmm. else is going to have it. Um, We also focus on as much as we possibly can U.S. based products. Um, and all of the material. So I handpick every single piece that we have in our store. I feel it. I touch it. I make sure that it's made with good products that it's going to last. So like if you buy something from Timu or Sheen, maybe you, you can wear it once you wash it. It's done for maybe, maybe, maybe Mm -hmm. Sophie may like, if you buy a piece from us for $55, you should have, you should have that sweater. For instance, you should have that sweater for years. Mm -hmm. Um, I love this one. Yeah. Is oh my, that is, that's our best, that was our best seller <laughs> all it. winter long. I love it. Best seller all winter long. So, um, so I think, and then also just understanding that when you're shopping from a small business, you're literally giving to that family. Mm-hmm. Like you're literally putting food on my table. And the economy as well. I mean, yeah. I think the, the big thing that I noticed with COVID, because it's, I'm going to be talking about it for the rest of my life, be like yeah. 80, COVID was terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we all will be. Don't right. worry. Um, everything changed. Uh, but I think the, the big thing that a lot of younger individuals aren't quite realizing is the the ramifications of, you know, one third of companies going out of business. Yep. Um, and I think that's a big thing specifically with small business, at least for Beowulf, Jen and myself, um, is that you, as much as convenience is great, convenience has the detracting mm-hmm. factor of bad quality products, yep. of not supporting the local economy or local businesses, right. um, which give back into the community. And it kind of, it's a trickle yeah. down effect. Yeah. Um, I also, I would like to note too, like, when we're doing well, we're also, we're constantly doing events that are giving back to local nonprofits as well. Mm -hmm. So we're able to, like, we always sponsor a little league in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, We work with Love Pup Foundation and they're a local dog rescue. And so we donate a portion of our sales during that. So if our store is doing well and we're, we're making good money, we're able to give, like you said, more back not only to our economy, but to our local nonprofits, to our local dog shelters, to giving back to the kids. Like, mm-hmm. I just think it's just such, it's not even about me or like my business in particular, but I just think the overall idea of shopping locally, shopping small, it just, it, it, there, like you said, there's just... It's just there's such a bigger meaning behind it. Well, I think the the interesting thing, too, is because I know this big thing and I've kind of always been critical about it ever since hearing about it. But this big thing with our generation specifically and maybe the generation after us yeah. is um, is like the donating. Right. right. And I think it's amazing to do that. The problem is these big companies come in and they say, oh, yeah, we'll give a portion of X to so and so. Yeah. Disappears into a massive money hole. Right. You never can really check where it goes. Right. And personally, I think if small businesses do that, it's more easily trackable. Right. You can say, okay, well, I'm going to go to that dog shelter or I'm yeah. going to go and watch a little league baseball game. Yeah. So I think that that's a definitely a really good point. Now let's, let's jump into some interesting questions. Okay. <laughs> um, now Jen and I always, you know, we often discuss the, uh, interesting dynamic that occurs in society amongst men and women. Um, the battle of sexes, as I like to think about it. Uh, I would love to get both of your opinions on business ownership as females. Do you believe female ownership leads to different organizational culture compared to male ownership? And if so, how might this impact business operations? I don't think it's necessarily a difference. I feel like a lot of the same issues that any of our male counterparts would have, the same exact issues are ran into on the other side of the fence, I think there's obviously a greater percentage of, of, you know, male uh, business ownership, which is why there's more of that, like you said, battle of the sexes, Mm -hmm. but the problems are the same, except the stereotypes that you mentioned earlier. I mean, listen, I'm not going to say, sit here and say men don't have their own set of stereotypes. They do. (laughs) They do. It's just, it's just, they're different a lot of the times. And, but I think once we look at each other and say, oh, we have very similar problems. We both have to pay taxes. (laughs) We both have to pay taxes. We all have to have, you know, difficult conversations with employees or. But I think there's such a difference though, like as a female boss or a female owner, if you are too hard on an employee, Or if you are too direct with anybody, it's not received the same as if a man does it. No. What do you think that is? I don't know. It's the whole whole like, like, oh, like a man is just like, yeah, they just like expect more out of you. Like they're just like tougher. They like want, I don't know. And then if a woman does it, she's like a 
correct. Well, it's either, excuse my language, she's either your friend or she's a bitch, right? Exactly. And, yeah. and I didn't know if I could say that. No, you can't. It's okay. <laughs> we're, 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 we're blurring <laughs> the entire fine. episode. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I would agree with you for sure on that. I mean, it's, yeah. there's definitely a line. And, and then you'll meet some who will understand that's yeah. just silly and they'll be, you know, totally normal about it. But there are definitely, I mean, I've ran into that myself too. It's exactly. like you're either everyone's best friend and yeah. they need to remember you're also boss uh-huh. you're also the one who's the leader but then you also don't want to cross the line of you don't want them to hate you exactly. so you have to find that equal balance between right so that's really hard because i'm definitely like a, a super friendly person and so sometimes i struggle with that line of like everybody wants to be my bestie and like i want everyone to feel comfortable i want them to be you know i want i want everyone to love what they do but there's times that i have to be a boss mm-hmm and I don't know that it's always received well. Whereas like my husband is, he's an engineer, but he's in management. And that's not even like a thought that crosses his mind. Right. And I, I think sometimes there's like the hardwired argument, but then there's also like, what's the societal expectations? Yeah. And if, I mean, I've, I would say that a lot of people look at women business owners as, oh, they're either so hardcore that they're very difficult to deal yeah. with. They're difficult. They're I've demanding. Been to, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're critical. They're they're insufferable, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Or they're so friendly, but it also opens the door mm-hmm. to people to maybe take advantage. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard balance. Yeah. That's a hard equalization point to it find. Is. Yeah, it's really hard. So, yeah. Well, that segues again into the next question. Are there any challenges unique to female owned businesses that hinder their growth and scalability in comparison to male owned businesses? I think kind of what we just hit. Yeah, yeah I think that Honestly. really, yeah, it goes right back to the same exact thing. Because like if you are really driven and you really want that and you are a go getter and you have very particular, like I feel like any time that I'm really particular about the way I want things done, I almost feel like I'm being too demanding. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, especially if you're someone like I'm just going to go out on a limb and say you're a very nice person here. (laughs) And (laughs) and when you want you, you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And I think that's maybe where there's sometimes a difference. I see you smirking over there because we've had this conversation before. Yeah. I I mean, I I, in my nine to five, I'm in a management position as well. And I've had to have like really difficult conversations. And it's it 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 doesn't feel good because you don't want to see someone upset. Yeah. And with my anxiety, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Are they upset with me? Exactly. And you're like, like, you're like, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to do the right thing for the business, but also for you for like, for all these different reasons. But in the moment when Mm -hmm. someone's emotional, that's not, Mm -hmm. that's not what they're thinking about. Understandably, because you can relate very easily. Right. Yeah. So, um, maybe (laughs) not for everyone. I'm not trying to do a blanket statement here, but I feel like personally there's sometimes an inference that a man's able to separate his emotions from a business situation while a woman has a harder time doing that because yeah emotional yeah (laughs) emotional psychoanalyzing yeah emotions evaluating both of you right now (laughs) not a blanket statement i'm just saying the generalization there for sure yeah yeah and here's the thing is i can i can I can sympathize with that. I can't empathize with that because my, my, I was always been, look, I'm pretty straightforward. Anyone who knows me knows that <laughs> there's going to be a point where I will say something. You probably won't like how I say it. Um, but I try to trend, like I try to tread the line, like you've taught me how to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, there is a dynamic difference. Mm-hmm. Now we've got a handful more questions and then we'll wrap up. Are there any instances where female ownership inadvertently perpetuates gender stereotypes within the workplace or broader business community? I mean, are you asking me still? Yeah, both of you. <laughs> I, I want to take over the well, conversation. Well, a good no, example yeah. is like the uh, we went to a convention recently, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know where I'm going on this. Mm-hmm. I'll, be, I'll be very, very high level with it. Um, there was a specific event that was female only and uh, as an observer i have my opinions you went, about what was you being went said as an advocate as an yes, advocate and went. and i it was welcome to men i was yes. in support with that being said it was interesting the story that was being told on stage and from my observational perspective i thought there might have been a little bit of a reinforcement of gender stereotypes um while also doing the i'm a boss ass bitch 
type Wait, of thing so at the same time. I'm trying you know? to understand. You. So I will I will <laughs> okay. say it in plainer terms. Okay. We were we were at an expo um doing some filming and, and stuff like that. And we went to this um woman's lunch, okay. luncheon thing, open to men and, and you could go, but it was like a woman's empowerment lunch. Mm-hmm. And uh the woman who went on stage, very successful, amazing. And um it, it was it it's straddled the line between like being very uh, aware of that and then it turned into like very much a we hate men conversation okay. on the yeah. stage mm-hmm. and I, I you know look i'm not trying to i'm not this is not a victim thing this is just me like no, it, was just, it was just hard to listen yeah. to because in my opinion it, it, it leaned into again a stereotype mm-hmm. of Oh, she's a woman and like a high powered woman in business. And she's she's only this is that because she hates the opposite sex. And it was just silly because we don't want to reinforce that at all. But at the same time, I wanted to acknowledge like she's a very successful woman. So it was. Yeah, I don't think, though, that like you can. I think you can celebrate women without putting men down. Of course. Um, I agree. I, I also think that. To be honest, like I'm a woman owned business but I would not be where I'm at today in my business without my husband. Mm-hmm. You know, same. I, yeah. I would acknowledge the same exact thing. It's, yeah. it was just one of those, it was, it was one of those instances where it's done right so often, mm-hmm. but the one time it's done wrong. Yeah. Not trying to point the finger at you. I'm just saying it stands out. It, does. it yeah. stands out. And it's just like, it's just like when you see a white piece of paper and it's got a black dot in the middle of it. What do you see? You see the black dot. You mm-hmm. don't see all the yeah. white space. Yeah. So so it was just that was a disappointment. Maybe, well, thing. yeah, and I, I'm not. I wasn't disappointed by. It. I mean, I got free lunch. I it was, was great. disappointed um, by it. But I, I guess the thing yeah, for me is for like sure. witnessing some of these things. It, it's you always have to kind of tread that line between being devil's advocate or being 100 percent on board while ignoring any downsides. And the way I've looked at it is, if it was on my end and it was a men's only lunch, uh, my goal would not. I was just that, gonna say, you know, it was like a men's empowerment. <laughs> like, that would be the funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all for like the women's lunches and everything. Yeah, I thought no, it was totally. great and it was open. Like, yeah. like anyone yeah. could I've been go to lots it. of stuff like that. Yeah, I might as well. Yeah. I'm probably just going to cut all that out. I'm going to paint a no, target it was on my back. Funny, it was just um, a funny recent experience yeah. we had. And I was like, yeah. I mean, but you so can, long. like I said, you can like empower women mm-hmm. and show the differences, but it doesn't mean you need to put down the opposite side. Yeah. 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 I think that comes back to the whole battle of the sexes and there needing yeah. to be a bad guy type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe if yeah. there is one. Uh, with that being said, last question. <laughs> what advice would you give to other aspiring, aspiring female entrepreneurs who are just starting their journey, especially ones looking to start their own clothing business? The biggest thing for for me that I would tell people is to keep going. No matter what you do, just keep going. Um, there are times that I wanted to give up so much. Like, I've been at the bottom. I've had the lowest of lows, but I've had the highest of highs. I think for me, just like persistence and just continuing and just there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. So there's always things you can do to keep growing. There's always events you can go to. There's always new things that you can learn. And I think that just in entrepreneurship, I think anybody who is an entrepreneur, who is an entrepreneur knows that it is one of the hardest things you will ever do. And I think you're just always going to have the ups and downs. And so being able to learn how to ride the different waves of entrepreneurship and just continuing to push through is really important. I also think when you, if you want to open a clothing boutique, I think you need to be more like, I wish I would have been more aware of what that looked like, um, what that meant. So I wish I would have talked to a mentor or talked to someone who owned a clothing boutique Um, to really understand what I was getting myself into. So I definitely have a goal. One of my big goals is to create my own how-to or to help other women business owners, especially that want to go into the boutique realm. Um, That's something that is like a future goal of mine because I really wish that I would have had that support. (laughs) Even just buying the right brands, right? There's so many brands I bought that I'm like, whoa, I can't believe I bought that two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like trial and error. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank good. you so much. Well, Erica, thank you for the conversation. Yeah. Where can our listeners find you on social media and what would be the best way for our audience to support you and the Sophie May Boutique? Yeah. So you can follow us on Instagram. Um, it's just at Sophie May Boutique. We also have a website, sophiemayboutique.com. 
we have a TikTok as well. I'm not great at TikTok because I'm a millennial. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have a Facebook page. I would say the best way to support us, honestly, is if you can't, like, if you can shop, that's great, whether it's online or in store in our Gilbert location. Um, but if you can't, it's honestly just giving us a follow on social media, commenting, leaving us a review, just like letting people know that we exist and that we're around.